Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you for our uh, public lecture today. I'd like to introduce Mike Gerbis. He is the CEO of the Delphi Group. And uh, Mike uh, brings over 20 years of experience in environmental management, and uh, he oversees the growth and strategic direction of the company. Mike has a Bachelor of Applied Science in Chemical Engineering from Queen's University and a master's degree in, en in environmental engineering from McMaster University. Uh, and just want to welcome Mike. Thank you, Mike. Great. Thanks, Tracy. Hi, everyone. So, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I get started, I always like to know my audience a little better. So, how many undergrads here first? And graduates? Engineering students? Other uh, business, let's say business, arts? Arts, okay, so mostly engineers. Okay, so tough crowd, all right. <laughs> all right, well, uh, first, thanks uh, very much for having me. Uh, I'm going to, now you're gonna be test group number one, actually, because I've started to develop a new presentation. So I may flip through some slides given the time I have. Uh, but what I've done is broken down the talk a little bit about the company real quick, uh, then talk about what I think is uh, number one problem uh, facing your generation especially, uh, which is unsustainable growth and climate change. And I'm gonna talk very briefly, give you an overview of climate change, uh, some of the impacts, talk a little bit about the business side, because I said I would, and then get into uh, solutions and what I think uh, you can do to help solve this problem. All right. So just briefly, uh, the Delphi Group, we've been around uh, over uh, 22 years and uh, we operate basically in two spheres, helping, oops, helping companies uh, develop corporate sustainability plans, i.e. managing their risks uh, around environmental and social issues, okay, and turning those into opportunities, and then climate change, which is usually a subset of corporate sustainability. We work with large companies, as you can see. Everybody who, uh, from people who uh, give you money to make you hamburgers, uh, to mine uh, and put petroleum and oil and gas in your car, right across Canada. We have four groups uh, within the company. We have a team that uh, tracks all the environmental policies in North America. Uh, we have a group, a management consulting group. They work with executives uh, who help craft the strategies and integrate sustainability and climate change into their business. And then we have a technical services group, all the engineers and scientists, and also a product uh, group now that's developing software tools uh, to help uh, benchmark employee uh, knowledge around sustainability or uh, corporate liability with regards to greenhouse gas, so a series of products. Um, I always like to boast about uh, the fact that we walk the talk and I challenge anybody who comes up to uh, a corporation or company who tells you that sustainability costs too much to do. Um, we're about 20 people, staff, and we give 1% of our gross sales to charity every year. That included during the recession when that represented over 50% of our profits. Right? But it has a tremendous value. We have a corporate culture that is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, lots of uh, joking, good times, flexibility. Uh, they give back to the community. Uh, we have a national scholarship we just launched, which you should look at. Uh, with Synovus, we have another scholarship at Carleton. We sponsor three children in Africa and so on. So we do lots and we're a very small company. But the benefits of giving back to the community are outnumber the costs 10 to 1. And I'm a real believer that a company is more than just a place to create jobs, right? We're part of the community. So we should give back to that community and we should <coughs> help invest in the next generation. Right, the need for leadership. <clears throat> leadership is defined in many ways, okay? There are leaders, uh, Nelson Mandela, who shape and change nations, and then there are leaders, individuals, who make small changes in their community or in their company by doing positive things, either for the environment or for uh, the community or for their family. And I use this as an introduction to the presentation because I think leadership is needed 
And just like Terry Fox took on the job of leadership to tackle cancer, we have a new cancer, and that cancer is unsustainable growth. Okay? And climate change is one of the uh, biggest challenges or symptoms of that uh, cancer that we can find. Okay? That leadership is going to fall more and more, or that need for leadership is going to fall more and more onto your hands and heads than it is on ours. All right, and it's going to come quite rapidly because of the uh, rate at which we are growing and the, and the degree in terms of which we're impacting the earth. Right, so what's the challenge? <coughs> well, the challenge is, is that this lovely planet of ours, this is a shot taken in 1972 by the Apollo 17 mission, and it's one of the most used photographs um, of our planet. And then what it shows is not only the beauty of the planet, but of course the finite, okay? How finite it is, okay? Although from a distance, this distance, it looks pretty large. What we can't see underneath is that <coughs> only a small percentage of it, about 22%, is actually biological productive, okay? The rest of it is oceans, low productivity, uh, low oceans, desert, barren lands, paved, and so forth. So there's only a very small slice upon which we can live and sustain life. What it also doesn't show is that on that earth we have beings, us humans, that are growing exponentially. And our population is exploding, right? Particularly in the last century. We've just passed 7 billion and by 2050 we're supposed to be around 9 billion people. And with that exponential growth, of course, comes exponential food demand, exponential water demand, exponential need for uh, raw materials, oil. Who's been in the Sky Dome? Anybody been in the Sky Dome? It's the largest volumetric building for those civils. We got civils there. Lots of concrete. Um, largest volumetric building in Canada. And to give you an idea of um, the amount of oil we use, you can literally fill the Sky Dome up and stack eight of them, so almost the height of the CN Tower, and that's how much oil we're using a day. We actually reached 90 million barrels, or 1,000 barrels a second, just before the recession, but we've dropped back down. The result, well, we've passed the biocapacity. That is the ability of the Earth to regenerate what we're using. Okay, so when we chop down trees, we take resources, we burn fossil fuels, the earth has an ability to regenerate that. And we were well below that capacity for a number of years until the late 1980s, and we've surpassed that now. pictures, eh? So Ed Bertinsky, he's uh, done a lot of these photographs and I encourage you to take a look. He's done some very interesting documentaries also. So one of the symptoms of this unsustainable growth, climate change. Now climate change, there's a lot of confusion I find uh, in terms of what climate change is. So let's go over some basic terminology. First, weather. So weather is what's happening now, okay, today, tomorrow, okay? Precipitation, wind, sunshine, etc. Climate is the average weather over a longer period of time, 20, 30, 40,000 years, okay? The climate does change and has changed on the earth as have the number of species and the land masses and so forth. Those monumental climate change changes have occurred because of solar inputs have changed. Right? 
the Earth's orbit changes, so they're called Milankovitch cycles. Okay, the 100,000 years, 41,000 years, and so forth, i.e. our orbit changes from elliptical to more circular. The Earth wobbles different and the tilt changes. Volcanic eruptions can have significant and dramatic effects on the climate. And now, what we're seeing is the emission of greenhouse gases is starting to impact our climate. Now how that works is we have uh, a blanket of greenhouse gases around the earth. Water vapor, uh, methane, carbon dioxide and so forth that basically absorb infrared radiation that's emitted from the earth after the sun's energy hits it. Okay, So it acts like a blanket. Right? The challenge is, is that we're emitting billions and billions of tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere every day. And that's driving up that, the level of, of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. We're now at about 391, 392 parts per million. Highest it's ever been in two and a half million years. Just to give you an idea, this is the number that uh, I recorded before I got on a train to Montreal and an hour later this is the number I recorded. So five million tons basically of CO2 entered the atmosphere in an hour and a half. Okay. So again, exponential emissions. What's that mean? <clears throat> that basically means that that blanket is thickening, right? That's all the greenhouse gases do, is they thicken, they act as a blanket. If you add more of them, they thicken that blanket, and the globe as a whole starts to warm up. Little example, Earth has a moderate atmosphere, it's quite thin. Relative to the size of the Earth, the atmosphere in which we breathe, and that is about as thin as a, the skin on an apple, if the apple is uh, the Earth. Okay? Venus's <coughs> uh, atmosphere is much thicker. Again, lots of CO2 and other gases. The difference in temperature, the Earth is about an average global temperature of 15 degrees. Without those greenhouse gases, it'd probably be minus 15 or lower. Okay, Venus, the average temperature is 457 degrees. Now, typically people jump up at me and say, well, wait a minute, Venus is a lot closer to the sun uh, than the Earth. Fair enough, but let's look at Mercury that has a very thin atmosphere of greenhouse gases. Whoops, and the average temperature there is about a third of what it is on Venus. Okay. So let's look back in history. I actually have a new chart now that goes back 800,000 and they're developing a new one for 2 million years. These are glacial periods, okay? The CO2 concentration during different glacial periods. The bottom being a good 4 kilometers of ice over North America. This is a nice sunny day. You put temperature, correlation of temperature beside it. All right, and you see the difference. Where are we now? We're here, okay? So we've never been outside 280 parts per million. We're now at 392, right? By 2050, we're gonna be here. So the question I'll leave you is, if the difference between here and here is the difference between four kilometers of ice and a nice sunny day or wintry day, then what's the difference between here and up there. Well, we're already seeing the results, the negative results. I won't get into this. I plot 10 different graphs because usually people challenge me on the man curve and the misinformation people have heard about uh, man's hockey stick curve and being challenged, which it was, but then it was shown to be correct. These are 10 different um, modeling stations around the globe uh, tracking uh, temperature no anomalies, global temperature no anomalies. And as you can see, they all start to point straight up. Other information, of course, 12 hottest years occurred in the last 13, and they're predicting 2011 will rank number one, number two. Okay. 
We actually broke over 4,000 <coughs> high temperatures in July alone uh, this year in North America and over 6,000 high, high daily lows. Uh, which is again what the climate modelers predict is that the temperature in the evening will actually get hotter uh, or not as cold uh, in the evenings because the greenhouse gases will trap the heat and we broke 6,000 uh, lows, i.e. they were hotter at night uh, than ever before uh, just in July. Uh, the ice cap is melting as we know. The difference between the average 1979 to 2008 and the low that we hit in 2007 and we just came shy in 2011 the difference in size there is about twice the size of Quebec about two and a half 2.6 million square kilometers <clears throat> of course if you watch the news <laughs> seeing more floods you're seeing Tornadoes yesterday, highest sustained winds ever recorded in January, the number of uh, states. You're seeing increased number of weather-related disasters, and of course, uh, insurance losses are uh, going through the roof with that. So a cost, economic cost. We're also seeing on the business side, damage, economic damage, whether it's the um, the canal not opening in Ottawa <laughs> as early as it used to and losing tourist dollars or snow hills having to produce snow now uh, to BC pine beetle destruction which has destroyed 80 percent of the pine out in BC and drought and so forth. Right, enough of that. So let's switch gears now. I inserted this because I, I mentioned I would talk about uh, business um, drivers and a little bit about why corporations are uh, trying to t tackle climate change. And one of the biggest drivers is very similar to the way BP took a hit on its uh, corporation's brand and reputation when uh, the Deepwater Horizon oil rig um, disaster occurred. Okay. Uh, the same reason um, that companies are starting to look at this issue. So they're not necessarily seeing the link right now between the environmental need to reduce greenhouse gases, but they are seeing the need financially um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And from my perspective at the moment, I don't think it matters. Okay. <clears throat> And what I mean by that is, is if we can convince companies to address their greenhouse gases or reduce their environmental impact through a business case presentation, then I'm okay with that. We'll fight them on the, on the science later, uh, but it's not worth taking that battle right now until people educate themselves more. And this is occurring on all fronts. <clears throat> and we saw this come true with the Keystone Pipeline. Okay? Um, the public, uh, in general, is starting to become more involved in issues that they believe are uh, creating an environmental or social impact. And that's making companies um, take a different approach. Investors are also making companies change, although as we talked uh, briefly uh, earlier today, a few of us, there's very few investors right now that are um, taking a lot of the information and actually changing their behavior in terms of their investments. Nevertheless, they're asking companies to report this information. So it seems a little backwards, but it's working. And it's working because we now have, as an example, for the Carbon Disclosure Project, companies that hold over $60 trillion in assets demanding companies, the top companies that they invest in, to report and disclose information around climate change. What are the greenhouse gas emissions? How are they reducing it? And so forth. When people start to do that, when they start to report and monitor and measure that, that's when they start to take action. Okay. And they start to take action for a number of reasons. One is a risk. Now, can anybody name some risks that companies may feel from climate change? Any ideas? No? 
infrastructure damage, right? Movement of pipelines, loss of uh, or disruption of supply chain like Thailand uh, when it was underwater. A number of the automotive manufacturers lost a lot of their supply chain. Other risks, reputation with customers we talked about. There's a fear of uh, liability or risk of regulation. Um, loss of their top talent. This is a very interesting one that more and more young people are asking their employers what they're doing on corporate sustainability, what they're doing about uh, greenhouse gas reduction, and this is actually having an influence at the executive levels. We just signed up a new um, energy company and that was one of the main drivers influencing them to start to look at climate change is the fact that they had had multiple requests from HR on what the company was doing with regards to uh, climate change. These are some of the, I won't go into these in detail, but this is from a survey of executives. Uh, there were about 300 of them um, grossing over a billion dollars US. And it asked them what was driving their climate change initiatives. And as you can see, it's the same as those bullet points. So very interesting. Energy costs, cons uh, consumers, right? Uh, carbon costs or the potential for regulations, brand risks, and so forth. There are more shareholder resolutions last year, again, asking companies to uh, take action or implement a strategy to reduce greenhouse gas uh, emissions than there were in any previous year. The flip side is a lot of companies, let's take GE, are recognizing that there is a huge potential in this for business opportunity. So like Apple, find a new market, right? Be innovative, step beyond the bounds, change your business model, and there is opportunity. And companies are starting to do this um, in terms of the opportunities uh, that climate change presents. So the real estate market is a great example where it's a non-regulated industry and yet uh, companies Bentall, GWL Realty, BLJC, etc. <clears throat> they're moving out front and starting to reduce their greenhouse gases, okay, to tackle waste, to be more responsible because they believe it gives them a competitive advantage. Plus they save a lot of money. <clears throat> These are some of the studies, just I won't get into them again just because of time, but uh, a number of the studies that have been shown are um, noting that with an integrated sustainability, which includes reducing greenhouse gases, companies, large companies are enhancing their profit upwards of 40% and small ones uh, as high as 66%. This is just another uh, uh, survey again of large entrepreneurs showing why they invest in sustainability and you can say the same thing about climate change. I'll show you the next slide, I'll show you the same. But again, productivity, retention, operating costs, drop in operating costs, and again, what are those executives saying about climate change? Same thing, energy efficiency, new products, so saving money, uh, entering new markets, right? Uh, responding to stakeholder requests, and so forth. All right, so what's preventing us? So I typically go into, uh, because I've been doing this presentation so long, I've been challenged so many times on various um, issues, some of them I'll tackle, that I, we, we created this section here. I'll only go through a few, and usually I have videos and so forth, but I'll, I'll skip those. So one of the biggest problems with climate change right now is that um, we have this ongoing movement uh, to create confusion in the marketplace. People are stating that there is a debate in climate change when there's no debate anymore. It's like tobacco smoke. Okay, but it's confusing the public, the media is getting on board, saying that they're trying to show both sides of the argument. Uh, at least from my research and all the things I've read over the last 20 years, I cannot find uh, a counterbalance to uh, the thousands of scientists saying uh, that climate change is happening.
pretty overwhelming, right? But let's give the flip side. Ninety-seven to ninety-eight percent of the scientific community, that's pretty consensus. That's you've got a good vast majority. If this was 60-40, that'd be different. 97 to 98 percent. You can find that, you can still find 2% of scientists who believe secondhand smoke doesn't cause cancer. So this campaign is providing, and it has a lot of money behind it, a campaign of disinformation. And that disinformation is all about trying to confuse or get the general public to believe that there are other factors, okay? So one factor is, and I had a great uh, video clip here, but I won't show it, is volcanoes, right? Volcanoes emit more than humans. Well, that's scientifically not true. In a given year, humans emit about 130, 250 times more than all the volcanoes around the globe in CO2. Right. Another one says, how about the solar energy, the input? Well, since 1980 it's been pretty well flat. Okay? The temperature hasn't been flat though. Right? And all the studies I've read, particularly from NASA and that, show that Solar radiation increased prior to 1980, probably represented about a 0.2 degrees increase in temperature. Since then, it's been flat, but our temperatures continued to increase. Okay. So third is, again, it, it usually rolls out, but just because of time. I do a lot of debates around the models with folks. So people say models aren't uh, accurate, and the global climate change system is so complex, you can't model it, et cetera, et cetera. Fair enough, those are fair points. You probably can't model it to the greatest level of detail to predict out 50 or 100 years. However, you can look at all kinds of other areas a scientific study that show that there is a correlation between increased greenhouse gases and an increasing temperature and thus resulting in climate change. Okay. This is another video that I have where a guy breathes out, uh, he takes a big breath and then he breathes out and he says, see all the pollution I just admitted was CO2 and he's ridiculing the audience. Of course, he doesn't know that if you take oxygen at a high enough percentage, it will also kill you, right? So, <clears throat> so this is just making the connection again to cigarette smokes. And it's interesting because if you do your research, a lot of the deniers who are supposedly climate change experts, Fred Singer is a great example. He actually used to work for Philip Morris and he used to campaign against secondhand smoke. So it's interesting how he's changed careers from a, a health specialist and now he's a climate change specialist. So I just put this up because this is where, for me, I draw the line in terms of, and I make the case with a lot of media folks, is there's a difference between showing both sides of the story when you have a debate and showing or speaking deception to try to fool the audience of something that you can't substantiate. And I've still not, I've done over 100 presentations and I've had people tell me they have scientific papers that show that GHGs are not the cause of climate change. I have not had one person send me a peer-reviewed scientific paper noting that. Not one. I did have a nice cartoon drawing though, graphs a guy had drawn in pencil with no references. Right. interesting is we need we know we need to have to change right 
and the, and the scientists are telling this, and yet there's a blockage, okay? We're not changing, even though, okay, even though, and I'm going to uh, skip to the next one, we have the scientific knowledge and technologies now that could actually curb our greenhouse gas emissions and level them off by the time we get to 2050. Okay, we already possess that knowledge and expertise. Now, there are lots of challenges with these. I'm not saying they're a silver bullet. Okay, but we can start to make a significant difference because of the innovation we have. And particularly if you just look around in this city and the innovation that goes on in the IT sector, right? if we applied that to a challenge like climate change, I don't think we would have too much trouble uh, solving the issue. And there's all kinds of technologies and solutions, and I just show a few here. This is a great proposal to make a super grid of, uh, with huge solar stations throughout the Sahara Desert linking in. Anyway, the, the person put the business case together that they could actually create, um, they could supply renewable energy to Europe and supply 100% of its needs for the next uh, 50 years. It's a phenomenal paper. It's a heck of an investment, but not a bad investment to make to spur on, uh, get us out of economic uh, recession. <clears throat> so mass transit, alternative fuels, green buildings. This is in Victoria. This building here uses about 50% ener uh, energy of a normal uh, condo. Uh, it's then supplemented by various uh, cogeneration facility uh, windmills. Uh, uses 80% uh, less water. Generates something like 60 to 70% less waste. It's fabulous. These are just pictures of <clears throat> technologies that uh, I've been seeing and there are some phenomenal technologies coming out. Some as simple as LEDs of course uh, and solar walls uh, but some far more sophisticated uh, one even looking at fusion in that that is uh, very interesting. But the most important thing I always come back to in this presentation is it doesn't matter what technologies we have unless we change, right? And I get a lot of folks, again, debating and pointing the finger at large oil and gas and the oil sands and the pipelines and saying, well, it's their problem. Except the problem is, is every time we point the finger, there are three pointing back at us, right? And they're, they're providing products and services for us. So it's up to us, right, to make a difference. So I'll leave you with a few things to get you started, and hopefully some of you will uh, take this on. And, you know, my colleague asked me what the objective of my presentations are. And I said to him, you know, I go around and do this and, sp and spend my spare time uh, away from the business, away from family, because I want to educate people. Two, I want to try to motivate you to think out of the box and challenge some of the deception that's going on. And three, I hope I grab just a couple of you that make significant change, all right, and do something the same. So one, I really be skeptical, challenge, do what I did. I've been for 20 years, I've been searching and reading papers and questioning everything about climate change. Okay, so do that. Understand the issues and engage those credible resources, okay? But please evaluate the source, okay? This is one of my favorite deniers because he is such a nutcase and yet he makes more trips to Calgary and Toronto and places and down in the states and makes presentation as a climate change specialist even though he's never written a scientific peer-reviewed paper in his life, okay, and yet he gets equal airtime to Andrew Weaver, a good friend of mine who leads the Canadian delegation of uh, the IPCC out of the University of Victoria, who's written hundreds of peer-reviewed papers. They also have some interesting social beliefs. So here's some sites. They're just a few, very few. There's tons of them. Down here, this Desmog blog is a real interesting one because um, <clears throat> Jim, wrote a, Jim Hogan wrote a book 
about the deniers campaign and sort of uncovers all the uh, policy institutes and deniers and where their money comes from and so that's a very interesting read. Um, Real Climate Org and the Grist Mill answer a lot of questions. They're written by scientists uh, who got fed up with all the um, deception again going out there. And I'll leave these with you so you don't have to write them down. To speak up, you know, get out there and challenge people. Uh, when they say, uh, once you've educated yourself and you understand the issues, challenge those folks that say it's not happening. Ask them questions. Tell them to show you where they got the facts, just like your profs do, right? Three is get involved if you can, and it doesn't have to be an environmental organization if you're more focused on you know, social issues, but get involved, okay? There's a, a huge need for charities out there, not for profit organizations, for volunteers. These are just two. This is one that I set up with a group um, a number of years ago and then partner with David Suzuki. This is an initiative I thought I'd throw up there. <clears throat> this is another one that our company leads. Uh, sorry, our company started the vision of it. The Young Volunteer Committee have taken this and run with it and made it into what I'll call a movement uh, for young people. And uh, the, the website they've set up right now, Leading Change 2012, is now getting over a thousand hits a day. <laughs> So the momentum is building and they have all kinds of programs in there. Uh, business case competition, an event out at Globe, a uh, workshop, a week-long workshop in terms of learning how to be an entrepreneur in the environment industry. So lots of good stuff uh, for those of you that are interested. <coughs> Third and most important is don't give up and please get on our leaders. Uh, we need leadership from our political organization, but of course, uh, we're not getting very much of that, uh, particularly on the environment side. So make sure you tell them that it matters and please vote, vote, vote. And finally, start small and think big. I always talk about making change like a snowball, you know? When you make a snowman, a big snowball, you, you have to get down, you have to push it, and it takes a long time, and then it gets bigger, and you, you push it slowly. But once it hits the top of the hill, then it goes by itself, right? But it needs more and more of us to make that change in small things. So a lot of people, again, argue to me, wow, the small things don't matter, we're only 2% of the missions. Yeah, they matter a lot. They matter a lot. Just like you asking your employer what are they doing around corporate sustainability is having an impact at the executive level, I can tell you. Okay? So those small things you do are fabulous. I guess I'll just leave you again with this beautiful picture of the earth. Uh, you know, you think about it, we only have one of them, right? And it's finite in size, and as you step farther back, it gets smaller and smaller, right? So you get three billion miles away, and Voyager takes a picture, and if you look at the one little dot, there's no one else really there to help us out, so I guess it's up to us. I'm going to end the chat and I'd love to take some questions or challenges or whatever you'd like. I'll just take this moment to, to thank Mike uh, for the talk um, on behalf of the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy. It was evident you spoke from the heart and with conviction and uh, you we also provided some tools for, for students and pointers. So I think, once again, thank you very much. Yeah, Mike. you're welcome, Tracy. Yeah. Yeah.